Uh, I'm going to talk to you in a different perspective, not one specific paper, but really in, 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 in <clears throat> a forgotten individual and a forgotten uh, bacteria. So I want to talk, take you back to the world before uh, there were conjugate vaccines, um, why conjugate vaccines were needed, and how that sort of influenced my life and career, and what's been the impact of conjugate uh, vaccines now. In the beginning, not really the beginning, but in the 19, prior to the 1980s, uh, Haemophilus influenza type E was the most common uh, cause of bacterial disease uh, in, in young children. Its, prior, its most common manifestations were epiglottitis uh, and meningitis in children less than five years of age. And it was extremely common. We now talk about meningococcal disease in, in the one in 100,000 range, but about one in 200 children uh, prior to introduction of vaccines, developed serious bacterial disease due to Haemophilus influenza type B. And some populations, uh, that risk was even higher. So this was a disease of, of the uh, youngest uh, children. You can see the arrows pointing here to the peak uh, disease uh, incidence in the first months of life. Uh, and the other curve on the right shows you the bactericidal antibody to Haemophilus influenza type B. Um, so clearly this is something that was, um, antibody was providing protection, but the antibody was not there in the first months of life. So back when I was a resident and I couldn't find a picture, it was sort of pre-photography um, of my, what I looked like when I was a resident. Uh, but in the 1970s, every night on call, people literally lived in fear of a case of, of meningitis due to him, or worse yet, a case of epiglottitis. So why was the fear of epiglottitis? For those of you who've never seen this, I've seen literally dozens of cases when I was an intern and a resident. This is a disease, inflammation of the epiglottis, which can uh, undergo spasm and then uh, instantaneously obstruct the uh, airway. And I can tell you, I had one patient I saw in the emergency room when I was in training that it was taking up to the ward and they had a respiratory arrest uh, in the elevator and I, Having never done one, had to do a tracheostomy on this child on the floor of the elevator while it was going up and down and people were getting on and off. So this is something you don't forget and you live in fear of in the future. So why wasn't there an effective vaccine available for before 1980s? Uh, polysaccharide vaccines have been developed and were used uh, in a landmark uh, trial in, in Finland where they were shown to be effective in inducing antibody in older children and adults, but not in uh, young children. Um, and although pure polysaccharide vaccines were immunogenic in adults, they were not in young children. So the main issue was the lack of response in children less than 18 months of age to pure polysaccharide vaccines, the period where Hib had the greatest risk. So what to do? At this time in the 70s, I was a resident and went to the pediatric research meetings uh, in Atlanta at that point in time. And prior to that, going to that meeting, uh, it was recognized as early as in 1929 that you could correct the uh, lack of immunogenicity of polysaccharides by conjugating them to a carrier protein. And that, that finding really didn't go anywhere until John Robbins, who's on the left, and Porter Anderson saw the potential to use this as a method to develop conjugate vaccines. And I heard a lecture by John Robbins at, at this meeting in the 70s uh, where he explained the concept of conjugate vaccines on a chalkboard, if you remember what those were. Um, and, uh, and really, that re I was really taken with that. He went on to develop conjugate vaccines for the pneumococcus, pseudomonas, staph, typhoid, amongst others. And I was really influenced by that lecture and went on to a career in vaccinology. So one, one example of this was the HBOC uh, Hib vaccine where purified polysaccharide from Hib was linked to CRIM carrier and we're now all familiar with that because children are routinely uh, immunized. And simplistically, I'm not an immunologist, but this was due to the fact that it was now immunogenic in infants, it induced immune memory and uh, reduced carriage as we learned with leading to herd immunity. And I had the privilege of doing the clinical trial for licensure uh, of this vaccine where we had 61,000 children immunized at two, four, and six months of age 
uh, with only two vaccine failures in children who had received only one dose of vaccine, no vaccine failures in the fully vaccinated children uh, in the trial, and 22 cases uh, in control. So what was the impact? I, I think we all know we don't see hip disease anymore. Uh, residents never see uh, epiglottitis or only rarely, and then usually due to other organisms. Uh, and we can see that hip disease uh, in young children has virtually disappeared, and this now benefit has now been extended to developing countries uh, with the institution of Gavi funding. Other lessons from the HBOC trial was that parental acceptance and participating in clinical trials in children uh, was quite high, and this was something that really was not known before then. It was possible to conduct large phase three trials, uh, and it was the HBOC trial was the first trial to employ real-world evidence to assess safety and efficacy, which demonstrated this was not only feasible, but it was acceptable uh, to regulatory agencies such as the FDA. And as we know now too, the success of this vaccine led to the development of other uh, conjugates for uh, strep pneumonia and uh, the meningococcus and typhoid and, and other diseases. So what's the point of this talk uh, then? Uh, I think the point is, as we come here to learn together and be influenced by lectures, is that one lecture can change the trajectory of someone's life. That was surely true uh, for me. And also one concept or idea, if you're persistent and carry it through to fruition, can save countless lives and improve the health of millions of people. So thank you very much, a far study.